That's good for the soul right there. Very good for the soul. Good morning, good morning. My name is Caleb Lynch, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's my favorite thing I get to do is to crack open the Word of God with you guys and, and uh, declare it as truth. Um, I don't know if you know this, uh, uh, according to documented history, um, we are actually in the presence of greatness here today. Um, the three greatest moms that have ever walked the planet are in this room currently right now, <laughs> all three of them. And so uh, you, you, <laughs> you've got Marsha Kuyper, you've got Stacey Lynch, and you've got Kaylee Lynch. And uh, according to what I've seen, they are the three greatest. Um, you guys have blessed me and taught me and shaped the way that I see life and my family and myself and Jesus. And uh, I'm not here today without those three women. So um, I'm shaky saying that. They're, they have blessed my life so deeply. You guys are... Um, yeah, I'd be a hot mess without them. So, thank you, Lord. Great is your faithfulness to me. Um, if you have your Bibles, we are going to be in Galatians 3, 1 through 14. 1 through 14, we're going to cover some ground today. Um, I, have, I have been praying for this whole week, um, one prayer, uh, as we go through these verses, and my prayer is that, um, that they would fall afresh on our hearts again today. Um, the words that you will hear today, for many of us who have spent any amount of time in church, um, will be repetition, will be something you've heard before, will be words that you have actually fully put your trust in, and my prayer is that, um, is that you would read them again, uh, and that they would ring true in your heart in a way as though it was the first time you heard them. And that, it, that the, the magnitude and the magnificence and the unbelievable reality of these words, that they would shape your heart again and remind you of why we sit here today and sing, Great is your faithfulness, Lord. Um, these words uh, today, if these were the only words you had in all of Scripture, um, it would give you a great depiction of, of how to be saved who your Savior is, and the plan of God from eternity past. Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. It would give you such a clear picture of the reality of what you have put your trust under, the system in which you have put your trust under, the person in which you have put your trust under. Um, these, are, these are magnificent words, and um, they are coming out of a man's mouth named Paul. Uh, he's writing these in a letter. Um, and he's writing them, and he's, he's a bit frustrated with the people in which he's writing to, and he is reminding them of the truth that they had recently put their trust in and were moving away from. If you haven't joined us for uh, our first several weeks of Galatians, what, what I would ask you to do uh, is go back and listen to it. Um, I, I don't like to spend all of our time as, as we're teaching through rehashing everything we've been through or what we've learned. And so if, if you would, when we're going through books like this, um, if you've missed a week or, if, or if, you, if, you know, whatever else, make sure you go back and listen to it because we are building off of each week to get to where we are now. If you weren't here last week, um, Caleb Smith taught, and I, I, I do believe it was one of the clearest messages of the gospel that has ever been taught from, from, from right here. It was unbelievably clear and helpful. And so go back and, go back and listen to it. Um, and uh, yeah. Things to look for as we go through this. Uh, I want you to look at how many question marks there are. Uh, Paul, Paul is doing something uh, that I think we can actually learn from, but he's doing something really unique. He's, he's going to confront... Some, some false ways of seeing life, some false ways of seeing God, some false ways of seeing, but he does it in a way of, um, he really just is asking questions. And he, he doesn't even give the full answer, but in the way that he asks the question, you already know what the answer is. It's beautiful the way he does it. So look for the question marks. He will actually start with his first five sentences, our first five questions. Uh, the other thing I want you to look for is, as we go through this, you're going to see uh, many of the things that he says are in quotation marks. He's quoting somewhere else. These are not his own words, and this is by design. He is wanting to point 
back to the Old Testament, Old Covenant, Old Testament Scripture to prove the reality of the new. And what had been done is that those Judaizers had come in and they had taken the old to disprove the new. And he's taking the old to prove the new. It's remarkable what he does. And so be paying attention to those two things. Watch how he crafts these words. Watch how he he articulates them. Watch how he uh, validates them. Uh, These are some significant words and much more to be chewed on than what what we will cover today. He's going to make it very clear that, um, that what we are resting in currently, this what we would call the new covenant, the new way in Jesus, that this is not plan B, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that his plan for humanity has always remained the same. So look for that. This is not just, oh shoot, now I've got to come up with a different plan. God has had a plan says in, in Revelation that the lamb was slain at creation. Um, he's just gotten done spending a lot of time defending himself and defending his gospel, and now he's turning back to the Galatians to reshape their minds. You ready? Let's roll. First verse, some kind words right out of the gate. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified. If you read it in the Phillips translation, it says, Oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. (laughs) Dear. My loving, dear idiots. Um, This is not the word that we see in Matthew uh, 7, where Jesus is talking about the foolish and how they built their house on the sand. Um, this is not the word of uh, what, what maybe you would say like mental deficiency, this word fool. Uh, this is actually, um, so, so that word would be moros in the Greek, and that really is talking about someone who's, whose brain is not fully completed mentally. He's not using that word. He's using another word. Uh, it's called antiotius, which has the idea of someone that can think but fails to use the power of their own perception. Right? So it's, it's this word of you, 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 are, you do have the ability to think sane thoughts and you are choosing to not think sane thoughts. So um, that's, where, that's where he's getting this word foolish. This word bewitched is really who has put a spell on you. It really, it really is. He's asking them this question, who, to, to whom have you come under such spell? And um, I think it's a good question. I think it's a good question for them as he's outlining the good news, as he's outlining the gospel, as he's outlining faith through Christ, Christ alone, not through works, not through these other things. And the Judaizers are coming in and saying, no, 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 no. It, it is Jesus, but it's also some of, some of these other things. His first question to them, if we're going to level the playing field, if we're going to get to the root of what's going on is, whose spell have you come under? Whose spell have you come under? Um, I, me personal, I'm just going to speak for myself. I so want to be so grounded in the truth of this book, the Bible, that ain't no spell ever have the ability to twist the way that I see the truths of God. And I don't know, I, I know I have the Spirit of God that convicts my heart and shapes the way I see, but there is nothing more clear than this book right here. There's nothing more clear that can safeguard my heart so that I don't become bewitched, so that I don't become under a spell of some other ideological system, some other way, some other concept, some other uh, authority that I know fully to whom I put my trust in and to what that means. And I I ask that that would be true of this place. Um, This season has done some damage to the church at large. And I'll, I'll just say it, um, I believe that it is from the evil one. I believe that the evil one has found a way to cast a spell on individuals, and it is, it is hurting the church. It is. And uh, what, I, what I want us to reclaim is truth found in the Word of God, 
us putting our full weight on this book for the hope of Jesus Christ being the one that has the ability to draw us back together and back in and that we would be rooted on the heart of God. And then he continues, he asks another question. He says, let me ask you only this. He's going to ask three more questions after this one, so that's kind of ironic that he says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? I'm going to ask you this one question. Tell me right now, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Did the Spirit show up as, as a gift because of your behavior in keeping good with the things of God? Or did it not? Did it come a different way? When God came to you, was it because you did something or did he simply, did you simply receive the Spirit by believing what you had heard? And then I would almost imagine him saying, why are you making this so complicated? Why are you making this so complicated? The Holy Spirit was at work because you believed in Jesus and not because you pleased Jesus with your actions. Righteous living results from believing in God. It does not precede it. You see, we live from it, not for it, right? You've heard that said, is that the Spirit of God is what then produces the good works, the behavior. So we're living as a result of it. We're not living with good behaviors to receive it. Right? Does that make sense, the difference there? Faith circles round and round. It's like this beautiful thing. Faith creates the spirit within you that then creates the, the works and the behavior. And there's got to be a starting point in a circle, right? Like we've got to find a starting point. And what Paul is saying, here's where the starting point begins, is that it's through faith, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have been granted the spirit of the living God within you, and it will produce some beautiful things that come out of you. The Holy Spirit is not a prize through the works of your behavior. It is a gift from the Lord. Amen? That's good news for some people like me. And then he continues, and he asks a couple of questions here, continuing with his kind words. Are you so foolish Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So he takes it a step further, right? He's not just asking, how did you receive the Spirit? He's saying, now, if that Spirit is evidence of your perfection, evidence of your cleansing that took place on the cross, right? We know that that's the truth of the Spirit is that now that I have been made clean, the Spirit has a clean place to be housed, right? It's, it's that evidence of that that, that cleansing, if that was the case, now how are you being perfected? Are you, are you continuing in the flesh now, or, or are you going to go around in the same way that you, in fact, received it? You've received the greatest gift, the Holy Spirit of God, by faith. Are you going on from there, not by faith, but trusting in your own obedience under the law, under behavior? This is the fundamental difference between law and religion and then grace. Under law, we are blessed and we grow by a system of earning and deserving. Earning and deserving. Under grace, we are blessed and grow spiritually by a system of believing and receiving. It's an entirely different system. God deals with you now, currently, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, under the covenant of grace, under this new way. And let's Let's not fall back under the law. I think this is the biggest falsity that is being done in the church. The church is very quick to say, yes, we've been saved by grace. We've been saved through faith as a result as a gift of God, not, a, not as ourselves. And then um, what we do from it there is we take it and we say, um, now let me see how, how I do with it. Let me take it the rest of the way. We appreciate the gift, and then we say, um, let me prove that I'm enough for such gift. There's some real backwards way of teaching, some real backwards way of receiving. You know what Hebrews 10 says, 14? 
says this. Did I not get it in there? Okay. It says this. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. This is one of the most astounding statements in all of Scripture. You understand what it just said? Let me read it again. For by a single offering, that offering was Jesus Christ on the cross, the payment for our sins, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. This is an astounding thought. That single offering on the cross has made you right, has made you perfect, has made you whole, has made you in right standing with the God of the universe. And that one offering, that one dealing on the cross is the very same thing that is maturing you and growing you also. Isn't that a beautiful reality of the work of the single offering of Christ Jesus? Once and for all, for all time. Verse 4. He goes on with another question. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? You see, the, the Gentiles, they were, they were actually being oppressed under the law, even though they weren't obedient to the law. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, like you had these religious Jewish people who saw these Gentiles as less than, and even though the Gentiles had no requirement to live up to the law, they weren't Jewish, they were being oppressed by those who were under the law. And so what I think Paul is saying here is, look, you received such an incredible gift. You got let in to be a part of the people of God. It was a free gift through Jesus Christ. You now have freedom in it. Why would you put yourself right back under the oppression that you once were under when you were already given this beautiful gift? Was it in vain? Was it for no reason? Was this unbelievable gift of Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation, was that in vain? After all you have gone through to then just put yourself right back into it. In other places, he says, don't fall back into that yoke of slavery. It's dead. It's gone. I wonder if sometimes that's easier though, right? Like, like if, we could, if we could just remove it for a second from, from, from a, a religious, spiritual standpoint. I, th I think falling back under a system in which you've always known, even though you know it might be a system of oppression and pain and darkness, sometimes feels easier and safer than something that is unknown, the freedom that is out there. Do you know what I'm saying? You see, um, as much as this is for salvation, these truths are for salvation, there is also a concept is that it also gives us a way to see life. And that, um, that oppression, that darkness, that, that coming under something that is choosing to rule over and to oppress is not a system that God has in place. If, if anyone in this room, look, look at me for a second, if anyone in this room is in a season of life where you are being oppressed or taken advantage of, or there is someone in your life that is mistreating you or making you feel less than, come talk to us. We, we believe that there is beauty and health and freedom and life in the name of Jesus. And, um, and we would love to get to step into that journey with you. Oppression and that kind of darkness is never the design of God. Never the design of God. And we'd love to enter into that with you. Tracking? We tracking? Verse 5. He asks another question. Does he who supplied the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by working of the law or by hearing with faith? Where do the miracles come from? Your hard works? You're following the rules? You're doing the things that impress God? Or are they through faith? That's what he's asking. I want to be careful here. Um, th this is the incredible thing of God, is that um, he does provide blessing. He does. 
you see it through, through all, all of Scripture, that we have, we have a God who provides blessing and miracles and beauty. He just does, and he always will. From now, from the beginning until the end, you're going to see a God who acts in beautiful ways. He just blesses at times. You just go, don't know why he did it that way, but he just sent down a beautiful gift. He just blessed. He blessed. Every single one of us in this room could point to moments where we go, I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but, but I felt blessed by the Lord. It was a miracle the way that that thing happened, right? We just, we just do. We live in this reality that there is a God out there that does provide beautiful gifts for his children. We believe that. What's been misunderstood... Um, is how we, uh, how we deal with receiving such blessings. You see, the, the, the church, especially in the Western church, the part of the world that, that we live in, um, we expect a God that gives blessings. And, and it's this unique thing that happens. Um, I, I don't know how to describe it exactly really well, but it's as though we're trying to suck the blessings from God. We, we try to create formula or systems or ways or understandings that would then like uh, cause God to then give miracle, right? And, and the truth is, um, when, when we work that system, he's no longer the giver of the gifts. We are, right? We're causing this God to say, uh, to, to make him do something for us because we've done something for him. That's actually, there, there's a name for that. That's called religion. That's called religion. If I, if I do X, Y, and Z, then the God in which I have chosen to do these things for will then bless me with said miracles. And, and Paul's saying, don't get it confused here. The giver of the gifts gives the gifts because he adores you, not because of anything you have ever done. Does that make sense? Tracking with me? There's no amount of behavior that will cause God to bless you more or bless you less. Can I tell you this? This one maybe takes it a step further. Do you know that the blessings and the miracles, they do bless you, but there's a purpose behind them, and they're there to draw you to the one who gave the blessing because he's the blessing. The gifts, the things, the stuff, the miracles... That's not the blessing. Do you know that? The blessing is the one who gave the gifts. And those gifts are meant to do this. Oh my gosh. Right? Like so, so you even understand when, when Paul was just a chapter earlier, he's describing when the Gentiles and, and these people received him and the Judaizers received him and the Jews received him and they're like, we can't believe the work that Christ has done in Paul. And what did it say that they did? They gave glory to God. That was the result of the miracle. The miracle said, there's a giver of the miracles, and he's the one that I want to be near. And that's, that's the beauty. Don't, don't, don't replace the blessing with, with the one that blesses. I'm going to give you homework, because we don't have time today. But I'm going to give you homework. I want you to go back and read those five questions again that he asked. And I just want you to put yourself into it. I just want you to get so intimate with these questions and, and, and to examine our lives and say, God, do I, do I trust you the way Paul is, is referencing I can trust you? Do I believe you the way Paul is referencing the way I can believe you? Do I believe that you had a purpose and a plan and a way and a system that I can come under that is far different than me taking the reins and trying to control, control my life? I want you to go back and read through those five questions again and just sit with it. They're some of the most profound, beautiful, grounding questions that we as believers can ask ourselves. I think they're a safeguard. And then he goes on, he adds this to it, he says, and, and we should be reading the verse before it, but I'll just keep going. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Do you know that there's, a, there's two ways to righteousness? There are. There's two ways to righteousness. One is abiding by and keeping every one of the laws of God. Every single one of them. Never missing a beat, never making a mistake, never sinning, not once, not doing it. That, that, that is a way of righteousness. 
The other way is through Christ's righteousness, him who actually did fulfill the entire law and then replaced himself with us on a cross one day through his righteousness that is then now accredited to our account as us being righteous. That's unbelievable, by the way. Like that is the miracle of all miracles. Talk about blessings. That is the blessing of all blessings. Can I have a circle a couple of words here? I want you to circle the words, believed God. Believed God. You notice there's not a word in between believed and God. The word you would want to put there is the word in. Abraham believed in God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. The reality is, is that he trusted God. He believed God. He believed what God said about him. He believed about what God was going to do through him. He believed God. And it was that trust, that's called faith, that's called trust, and it's actually the only way that you can please God, it says. And that's what he did, is he said, I I trust the words that are coming out of your mouth. That's what he did. He didn't believe in him. Even the demons believe in him. Paul believed God believed his words. Do you know that's the very core of all of this good news? um, we, we, We limp through life. We do. Every single one of us. We're just limping through life. And, um, the very thing that will keep us from falling over the very thing that keeps us standing and breathing tall is if we are able to put our trust in who God says we are. If we can truly believe who God says we are, truly believe what God says to be true, that's what keeps us standing. My recommendation, when God says something is true, believe it. It's, just a, it's a recommendation. You can take it, you can do with it what you want. And understand this, this is not just a system to get you home. This is not just a way that will provide for a way to get you home. This is a way and a lens in which you get to see life itself. Walking in step with the one who is providing truth about who you are, who he is, who we are together in fellowship, that is the gift of believing God, is that it keeps you moving forward day by day, every moment of every day. It safeguards you for the now, and believing God is the very thing that actually gets you home as well. Come on. (laughs) Believing in God is the establishment of the new. New destiny, new way, new you, a new understanding, a new way of seeing others, a new way of seeing yourself, a new way of seeing God, a new way of seeing purpose, a new way of seeing hope, a new way of seeing forgiveness, a new way. He's offering a new way by believing God. Not believing in God, by believing him and his words as truth. Have you ever had those moments where you were giving something or something was revealed to you and all of a sudden it changed everything for you? Like it just changed. I can remember being given the keys to a car and I had the freedom to now go drive wherever I wanted to drive. The same world I was living in for 16 years prior looked entirely different to me simply because I had this keychain with a key on it and a vehicle. Like now the streets look different. My capacity looked different. My friends looked different. The amount of food I could eat looked different. Everything looked different. Like the world around me just felt different. And that's what trusting and believing in God does. He continues to kind of talk about Abraham, and this is verse 7. We're going to keep moving. Um, Now then, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. This is an incredibly important statement. 
There's so much in here. We could, we could spend a whole day just on these four verses. The first thing it does is that it took away the arrogance of the Judaizers who claimed pedigree based on lineage. Right? That's what the Judaizers were doing. That's why Paul is using this statement. He's saying, look, 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 look. Yeah, we understand the Jesus thing, you Gentiles, you're getting in with the Jesus thing, but we got to tell you, there is a guy we look back to who was kind of the big dog. He was the beginning of the Jewish people. He was the beginning of the, of the way of God, his people of God, and he did some things. He followed some rules, and so because he is in our lineage, we now re receive the pedigree and, and, and the responsibility that comes with such positioning. So it takes away that. Second thing it does is it shows that God has been consistent in his plan of right standing before God long before Jesus showed up onto the planet. So this, is, this is incredible. It has always been grace through faith. Always. Abraham's righteousness before God was because he trusted him, because he believed him. That's called faith. It's a beautiful reality that we don't see two different gods. We see one God and one plan and one purpose, and that is to bring us home after the garden. He puts in a phrase in here to Abraham, in you shall all nations be blessed. In you shall all nations be blessed. Those are significant words. Do you realize that you and I, the Gentiles, that we were included in the plan from the beginning? God in his design did want to have a people that were set apart for his purposes to, 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 to protect the lineage of Jesus and to get us to where we are today. But the plan has always been that for anyone who chooses to put their trust in Jesus, that there is a way home. Not for a specific group, not for a specific person, but that all that all nations might be blessed through him. That is significant. Do you like that Paul uses the word? Um, where is it? Oh, yeah, verse 8. That he preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Do you like that God was doing some preaching of the gospel? Back then, I like that. I like that. Sadly, Christians have taken this glorious truth and misplaced it and misapplied it and misspelled it through the centuries. This has been the verse that many claim to support the replacement theology, the idea that God is finished with the people of Israel as a nation or a distinct ethnic group and that the church spiritually inherits all the promises made to Israel. I don't know how this all works. I'm not going to claim to know how it all works. What I do know is that God is not done with the people of Israel, and I don't know what his plan is. But I do know that Romans 11.25 says that there's this partial hardening until the Gentiles have received and that he's got another... I, I don't know how it all works. What I do know is that Abraham did have some lineage that came after him that were his genetic people, and he had some lineage that came after him that were his spiritual people. And I do know this, that the, the best way to Jesus, the best way to salvation, the best way to home is to be a spiritual child of Abraham, which is faith in Jesus Christ. I know that to be true. I don't know the rest of the story. It hasn't all been revealed yet, um, but I certainly don't like all that the church has done or claimed. Underline the word scripture in this verse. Paul is not only speaking of a theology through experience alone. That was part of Paul's message was, hey, I was on this road one day, a light shined on me. Jesus started talking to me. He gave me some stuff to say, told me to go do this, and that's what I'm doing, right? That's just experiential theology. What Paul is doing is he's saying, this theology that the Lord gave me is actually found in Scripture. This, this is a foundational thing that all of us should be doing. When revelation comes our way, when someone claims reality of truth and it comes our way, the most safeguarded thing we can do is to go, hey, let me take a minute, if you wouldn't mind, and see if it lines up with this good book. And that is uh, significant in what he's doing as he's explaining these things. 
You know, we believe this book is closed. They call it a closed canon. We believe that there is no future revelation that is going to be put into this book. We, we believe this is the revelation from God to humanity and that it is full and it is complete and it is everything we will receive until we get home. And boy, we're going to get some other stuff when we get home. But until we get home, this is what we've been given. And so if someone comes along, and I won't point out any other religion that have done such thing, but if anyone comes along and preaches to you a different gospel, is what Paul says, a different gospel, whether it's an angel or us, or anyone else teaches you a gospel that is contrary to what is in this book, it's not the real gospel. In fact, it's not a gospel at all. It's not good news at all. There is only one gospel. There is only one means of salvation, and it is through Jesus Christ and him alone. Verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Strong. <laughs> for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Underline all and do. You understand what's being said here. It's, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not a scale. It's all or nothing. Either you completely satisfy the law or you're not in. That's it. And, and it's not only that you're not in, you're actually cursed. And you're not cursed just by your bad behavior or cursed by the devil or cursed by someone else's bad behavior. Did, listen to these words. You're cursed by God. What? What? Do you understand that for him to be a just God, sin must be cursed. Sin must be cursed. story gets better. Hold on. Stay with me. Let's keep rolling. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. This word no one is a really interesting word. When you separate it out, it actually means no one. Like literally, like in the Greek and any other language you want, it's actually no one. It's crazy how, like, when you just spend some time with a word. Uh, uh, he's quoting Habakkuk 2.4. He's quoting Leviticus 18.5. This is, I like what Luther said about, about this verse. He said, this is Martin Luther. He said, the faith of the fathers was directed at the Christ who was to come, while ours rests in Christ who has come. Our hope is in the finished work. Their hope was in the promised work. It's interesting. This, this phrase, the, the, the man who does them shall live by them. This is Leviticus 18.5. Um, it, it's just this idea that if, if you've chosen to come under this system, well, then now you have to live by such system, right? And, and according to this statement, no one is able to live by such system. And therefore, no one can be justified by the law. It's interesting. The law was put in place, and immediately, God created an alternative system alongside of it to forgive you of such sin. It's called atonement. It's called covering. It was like he went, I ain't going to be able to do this one. And I got, I, got to, I got to give him some way to stay in good standing. So once a year, Yom Kippur, atonement. Right? And then atonement came through one, a one time offer that satisfied all sin for all time, and that was through Jesus. Isn't that interesting? God, even in the garden, what did he do when Adam and Eve sinned? He covered them with the blanket of animals. He's always been about covering the sinner and their sins, and now he just has a fantastic way through Jesus Christ, covering for all time, for all sins, past, present, future. Beautiful reality. Because this is what happens. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. It's just, this is the most beautiful words by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Don't ever miss the incredible reality of verse 13. 
everyone who could not fulfill the law, that's everyone, was cursed by God. Was cursed by God for eternity. One location they're going. And what happened is that through Jesus Christ himself, what did he do? He didn't just wave the curse away. He just didn't, he didn't just say, he didn't just say, here, what, what's it, what's it gonna cost to pay these this pay this curse off? No, he actually became it. Like literally became the very curse that all time, all people of all time had on them, he became it. And why did he become it? Well, let's keep going. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Listen to this. This is the best, the best news right here. Not only did he become cursed, he became cursed so that we would receive the blessing that was rightfully his. Is that crazy? That right standing that he had with the Father, he gave to us the very moment he became that curse and we trusted in him. You see, this is, this is what they call a good, uh, just like a swap. <laughs> and it's incredible. It is absolutely incredible. And do you want to know what the blessing is? Himself, his spirit through faith. Him. Play it back for me, with me for a second. He became our curse so that we might receive him. That's unbelievable. That is, that is the gospel laid out for you. That is the good news of Jesus Christ is that you were once cursed and he was not. And he loved you so dearly that he became your curse so that he would never leave you nor forsake you for the rest of your time. And that you would then get to spend eternity with him because you are now right in his eyes. You've been made right and you are right. Let's stop there. Yeah. Let's stop there. When you take this bread and this cup this morning, you take it in remembrance that the curse was not just satisfied, but that it was swapped and that you received the blessing of the Spirit of the living God within you. That is unbelievable news. And uh, let me pray to thank the Lord for it. Jesus Christ. You hung on that tree and it was a mark of shame and it was the mark of embarrassment and it was the mark of a cursed man as you hung on that tree and you hung on that tree so that it would remove the curse on my name, on my head so that I would not have to hang from that shame and what you did Lord is you then gave me the blessing the blessing that you gave Abraham through faith. And it was your grace. It was your love that you gave me. And that blessing translated into your spirit that now indwells me. It gives me life. It gives me a way of seeing that protects my heart. I, I don't know where I'd be without you, Jesus. I know I wouldn't be standing here, that's for sure. I love you, Jesus. I take this cup and I take this bread and I do it in remembrance of you because you made the way. We love you, Jesus. Amen.